was from the Gospel of St. Matthew, chapter uh, 12, verse 1 to 32. He says, at, the, at that time, Jesus went through the grain field on the Sabbath. The disciples were hungry and began to pick some heads of grain and eat them. When the Pharisees saw this, they said to them, Look, your disciples are doing what is unlawful on Sabbath. And he answered, Haven't you read, uh, read what David did when he and his companions were hungry? He entered the house of God, and he and his companions ate the consecrated bread, which was not lawful for them to do, but only for priests. And how did you read the law that on the Sabbath, the priests in the temple uh, dis uh, desecrate the day, defile the day, and yet are, are innocent? I tell you that one greater than the temple is here. If you had known that this words, uh, what these words mean, I desire mercy and not sacrifice, you would, have, you would not have condemned the, the innocent. For the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. Going on from that place, he went into their synagogue. And a man with shivo hand was there. Looking for a reason to accuse Jesus, they asked him, Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath? He said to them, If any of you has a sheep and it falls into it falls into a pit on the Sabbath, will you not take hold of it and lift it up? How much more valuable is man than a sheep? Therefore it is lawful to do good on the Sabbath. Then, then he said to the, uh, to the man, stretch out your hands. So he stretched it out and it was completely restored, just as sound as the other. But the Pharisees went out and plotted out how they might kill Jesus. This is the first part. This is from verse 1 to verse 14. On the beginning, our Lord was walking through a grain field. And his disciples were hung, uh, hungry. And for that reason, they stretched out their hands and ate from the court. When they did that, the Pharisees came. And they start accusing. They start accusing them. But their, accus their accusation was very calm. They wanted to look like they are standing up for the law of Moses. You know? They wanted, they wanted to look like that they are concerned about the Sabbath. But later on, you will see that their true intention is revealed. And so they came to him and they say, look what your disciples are doing. They're eating on the Sabbath from the corn field. Meaning that they are taking, breaking a, a, a piece of grain from the seed and trying to eat it. So on Sabbath, according to the Old Testament, even in our church, on, on Sabbath, we honor Sabbath by not doing extra things, by not doing anything new. We use what we have prepared from Monday to Friday. We prepare everything for Sunday and for Saturday and Monday. We prepare everything during the weekday. What we have prepared, we use it during the weekend. You see? That, that is the law. That was the law that was given to Moses. Sabbath is supposed to be a time of the day of rest. Rest from worldly deeds. World, worldly trouble. That is the goal of Sabbath. Meaning that when you rest from the labor of this flesh, what happens? Your soul, you get to work on your soul. You get to meditate on God. 
see? Sabbath is consecrated for a rest for the rest of the flood. But our soul is more inspired, more working on the Sabbath. So it was this was the law. And yet the disciples while going, they were hungry and they took grain to eat, which was for their blood. They didn't eat the grain for their soul, right? So the Pharisees saw this and they came and they accused him. Don't you see what your disciples are doing? Don't you see what they, they are doing? Aren't you going to say something? Aren't, aren't you going to give them advice? It's Sabbath. No? There is a curse. If you don't keep Sabbath, the curse that was written in the book would be upon them. You want that to be upon them? They, they say. So he responded, knowing their intention and knowing the situation, he responded to them saying that, have you not read, have you not read that King David and those who were with him ate the grave, this consecrated grave which was not, which they are not, were not allowed, but only the priests are supposed to eat today. This story we find it in the book of Samuel, 1 Samuel chapter 21. In that, during that time, King David, uh, after he killed uh, Goliath, what happened is that the daughters of Jerusalem starts praising praising uh, King David, saying that Saul, King Saul, killed hundreds, and David killed uh, uh, slaughtered thousands. So for that reason, he's getting more praise, and he got, the king got God jealous of King David. So finally, he tried to kill him in many ways. When he couldn't, finally he decided, you know what? I'm the king. Whatever I say becomes the law. So he said, from now on, if you find king, uh, if you find David, kill him. He made a decree. He started actively seeking him to kill him. But no one knew at that time. So he fled for his life. He fled for his life and came to the priest Abiathar. When he got to Abiathar, Abiathar doesn't know what was happening. So he came to him, he came along and he said, aren't you King David? The general of Saul, the king? Where are your soldiers? Why are you alone? He says, well, I have, I, I'm, I, I, we have been hungry and we don't have any food. We don't have any food that we can spare. The king has ordered me to do something and I am in a rush if you have anything to do. Through, because of the urgency, he didn't examine it. So he said, I don't have any food, but the only food I have is the consecrated bread. But you are the general of the king, so anything you want. If your soldiers, those your companions, are pure, let them eat from this bread. And with that, he gave him the consecrated bread. And they ate, and from after that, King David was able to gather his strength and start fleeing, actively fleeing from King Saul. He, he saved his life through that act. But according to the law of the Moses, that bread, consecrated bread, is only allowed for the priests. And he ate because he was hungry to save his soul. Right? So the same way our Lord recalls and says that, don't you remember what happened with, didn't you read what happened with King David? You see? What is more important is the salvation of the person. You know? What comes first is the salvation of the person. That is what he was telling. And he says, at least this one 
had, were hungry. They had both of them, the, the apostles, the disciples had, were hungry. King David was hungry. So they ate because they were hungry. But even furthermore, you say, didn't you read that your priests are to defile the Sabbath, to, to defile the altar on the Sabbath day? Didn't you know that? If nothing is allowed to do, to be done on Sabbath day, the priests inside, say, your priests inside, do all kinds of things. But they are innocent from it. Because they are there for the service of God. Even though they were going, they are going against the law. So, says, if you have known this, you would not have accused my disciples. What is it that we learn from here? What is our Lord say? The apostles, the disciples, were hungry. That is a weakness, right? All of us have weakness. But the thing is, what is stopping us from being with Christ is not our weakness. It is our own selves. Unless we stop ourselves from being with Christ, our weakness does not stop us. He has been patient with us from childhood. From childhood, anything that we do, He knows. And we think we sometimes are deceived by the devil when he tells us that we don't want to offend God in his house, to steward in the world, stay in the world. Right? We think, oh, I'm too much, I'm too much of a sinner. I, I, should, I, I can't go to church. I can't be a Christian. Why? Because I'm weak. God knows that you're weak. But the thing is, at least when you are in the house, when you are with Christ, the apostles have a chance to grow out of that weakness. Because they were with Christ. And indeed, they eventually did. All the apostles not only were patient with hunger, with the uh, hunger, they were patient until death. Most of them. Think about the uh, St. Thomas, the Apostle Thomas. He was king alive. Imagine. Like, if it is hard for them to be patient when they are hungry, how did he became patient? And how was he able to be patient when they skinned him alive? And they used his skin to, uh, into a, they made it into a sack, and they built sand in, in that sack, and they made him carry it all around India. What gave him that reason? Because even when he was sick, he was, even when he was weak, he was weak with Christ. He was still walking with Christ. You see? If the, the priests, if the priests, they do it in the let's say for that reason because it is it, they are in the holy of holy, it doesn't define the way they do wrong. Say if you have opened your eyes, you would have known that there is one here among you that is greater than the Messiah, the Holy of Holy. What makes the Holy of Holies holy is himself with them. You see? God was patient with their witness. He was merciful towards the apostles. You see? What God wants is mercy, not judgment. We think that God is looking out with, uh, like, we think like uh, God is like a cruel parent with a belt looking for a reason to spank their kid. He's not that. He is, he is patient with our weakness. What he wants is us to return to him. 
is it? Because he gave their support. But when we say this though, St. John Chrysostom warns us, do not think, but even though Christ said this, this is not an excuse to do all things and still come back to church. It's like stay in the church and you act wild. There is no restraint to you. It doesn't mean that. It doesn't excuse us to do anything we want. Of course, there are limits. Hunger, people, you don't choose to be hungry, right? When you, you don't choose to be hungry. Out of nature, when you don't eat, you get hungry. Through time, as you grow, as you get used to the fasting, the hunger might not bother you as much. But the thing is, naturally, it is easy. There are some weaknesses that we have it from nature. And that we have to grow out of. With those guys in person, but other things, for instance, murder, adultery, insult, do you think God will be made patient with it? No. So St. John Christ warns us not to think that this is an excuse to do whatever we want. So the first part is that he says, I choose mercy, not sacrifice. I don't want your sacrifice. What I want first is mercy. I want to forgive you. I want you to be to come to me. See, earlier you have seen the deacons and the Sunday school uh, singing, right? With the Well, what were we singing? We were singing the Tukusiai Women Mumai, right? Women Mumai, what is it? Who is merciful like you all? Every one have their hope in you. That was what we were saying. Our hope is not our perfection. Our hope of entering into the kingdom is not because we are strong. It is by the mercy of God. See? So, the first part is this. But, the second part, what you see is that when he, when he gave them answer to their question, instead of learning from it, they were angered more. You see? They were angered more. And they say, they went out to look for a reason to how to kill our Lord. So they start saying that, they start the rumor saying that when he healed the man, again, they say, you see, he's healing through the power of the devil. They start accusing him because they were angered that he did not strive, review the apostle. Sometimes this, we do this in our church, especially when we are you know, in the Yaragona, the Sunday school. It's like we learn one day, one sarat, one canon of the church, and we, we start keeping it, and we see someone that does it. Oh, that person has mercy on May God have mercy on him, right? Like, how dare you? How dare you not do this? You're supposed to do this. We must be careful in our zeal to keep the canon of the church that we don't become the reason that our brother is lost. That is very important for us. God, our Lord, He did not die for the canon. He did not die to save the scriptures, right? He died to save our soul, to save your brother. What comes first is saving your brother. Then after that, you keep the canon, you elevate him. You inspire your brother to honor and to follow the canon. What comes first is mercy. So, questioning the, the Pharisees, they did not, all they care about is that they were not rebuked. So they, when he didn't rebuke them, they were angry and they went out, started saying what? Rumors saying that, look, he's healing through the power of the devil. 
So I responded to that, saying that, what could not do this, and said that man, it does not matter. Would you have to stand here? Any kingdom that doesn't stand together will fall. Any kingdom that doesn't stand together will fall. See? He's telling them about the parable. Even though he was answering to their question, but he, what he's talking about is the parable. They try to keep the, the, the commandments of God, which is beneficial for the soul, right? But the, the thing is, they keep it in their body, and their flesh is further away from God. Their flesh, is, they keep it in their flesh, their soul is further away from God. You see? God is merciful, and they are not merciful. God is love, and they are not love. So, when sometimes we have this saying, especially in America, where we say, oh, my spiritual life is good. Oh, my work is good. Right? Oh, how's life? Life is good. How about spiritual life? Oh, spiritual is, and life is good, right? How many lives do we have? One. One. If we have one life, why are we making a separation? Our spiritual life is not, is not limited to the church. It's not limited to our prayer for us. It is everywhere we go, it is we are Christians. When we work, we are Christians. When we sit, we are Christians. When we sleep, we are Christians. So, any kingdom, the kingdom that is within us, our flesh and our soul needs to stand together for the work of God. No matter what. Otherwise, he did he say, it shall fall. It will fall. So, in the, you know that in history, the shortest, the shortest battle that was fought was, uh, I think, two minutes. So, two countries, two kings, they were uh, friends before. So, they uh, used to work together. But, eventually, their pride got to them, and they say, you know what? They declared war against each other. The soldiers, these soldiers, have been dying together for years. And these soldiers know each other. They have become families. They have married into each other. This is in Europe. So the soldiers, the generals, got together and they say, you know what? This is a battle. The battle is the kings don't like each other. You know what? Let them build on their own. We'll get them. We'll get, bring them to the battlefield, and we'll make them fight each other. Whoever wins, wins. We're going to be okay. We're not going to die for no reason. So the kings, they, they brought the kings together, and they said, fight. After two minutes, they said, enough, enough. Let's make, let's call truth, and they went back. You see? Sometimes our flesh, our mind, is saying some, uh, something else. We say, oh, we want to be a Christian. We want to be in the house of God. We're struggling with temptation. And we want to gobble with the world as well. Right? We want to go out and enjoy life, have fun, relax. Right? So, that kingdom is to be like one. He told us. But the main point, the main takeaway is that God is merciful. God wants mercy. And He wants us to be merciful to one, to one another. And if we come to Him with merciful heart, if we forgive our brothers, if we show mercy to our brothers, we show mercy to one another. So, that is what uh, the Gospel is. Uh, on today. May God help us to be merciful and to inherit his kingdom and through his mercy. Also, I'm going to get a little bit of 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 a